I, I hate it when people say somebody needs no introduction, then goes on to introduce them. Uh, uh, but go uh, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, but I do want to start in the realm of what might have been. Um, a few years ago, uh, I think 1997, uh, Larry and Sergey almost got acquired. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this? And I always wonder what the world, how the world might be different if that had, in fact, happened. Uh, well, uh, we had developed this technology we called uh, PageRank, sadly not BrinRank, but anyway, it probably would have sold better that way. But um, uh, we had developed this technology that we found was useful for search. It by itself uh, it wasn't really a complete search engine. What we had kind of just searched titles of web pages and, uh, and ranked them quite well. Uh, but we showed it to a bunch of the existing search companies back then. Some of you might remember them, you know, InfoSeq, Excite, Lycos. Uh, and uh, probably the greatest interest came from Excite. And it actually came from Vinod. You were the, the investor in Excite. Uh, and we spent a while uh, talking to them ta and, and talking, talking to you, Vinod. Yeah. Um, you remember that. Uh, in the end... Um, I don't think the management team there was quite as excited about it, no pun intended. Um, but I remember we were, you know, we were just, there were four grad of us at the time, four grad students at Stanford. And I remember we fired off a note to the note. It was just like a little email. We said, like, you know, we don't really want to sell, but okay, for $1.6 million, you got a deal. And, uh, a few minutes later, we got a reply and said, that's a lot of dough, but okay, we'll do it. Um, I know, that's characteristic of another. So then, <laughs> 10 minutes later, Scott, one of the four of us, comes running in laughing, huge grin on his face. He had faked the reply. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, back then, you know, the ethics around faking you weren't quite the same. Anyway, um, so he had that big joke, and the deal obviously never came to fruition, and we went uh, our own way uh, to build, build search. So the way I remember it, we actually agreed on a deal around $350,000. What? This is typical. <laughs> are, you, are you trying to renegotiate this now? But, <laughs> But, but I had a hard time getting the management team to agree that they should uh, acquire Google. I think he's saying that they were having our time going to 350 and we were having a hard time changing our number. Yeah, that, they felt they didn't need it. Uh, but, you know, I, I start here for one very simple reason. There are many, many instances where things could have gone either way. And I'm really glad they didn't acquire because the world might have been a very, very different place. Looking back in retrospect, I feel like it would have been really, really sad if, in fact, uh, Larry and Sergey had sold the company and not pursued the vision and changed the, way, the world the way they have. So uh, I've... It's, it's actually kind of an interesting story because... The reason we didn't sell it is not so much the money. I mean, like, I don't know, we were like grad students, you know, eating burritos or whatever. So like a million dollars was a fair amount. Um, the reason I think we really didn't sell the company was that we talked to all the search companies at the time and they just weren't interested in what we were doing. And so, and it was obviously like, didn't want to buy like, you know, this company that didn't really have anything without the people. So they wanted us. But like we were like, well, why are we going to work at this place that doesn't believe in search? You know, it's not going to cause anything good to happen. So I think ultimately we didn't sell for that reason, just that they weren't interested in it, which same reason they, whatever, had trouble getting to a million dollars, which I guess at the time was a lot of money. Um, but uh, 
But I think ultimately for me, it was just about wanting to actually, you know, search seemed pretty important. It was about to actually wanting to do something in that area. And it didn't seem like that was going to happen in these organizations. Yeah. You know, it's amazing when the business people take over how rational they get focused on short-term revenue and lose the long-term vision. Um, that's a good place to kick off on a different point. Um, there's a, most companies end up in failure, and I'm not talking about just the startups, but if you look at the S&P 500, so many of the very large companies keep going out of ba business at an increasing rate. Um, people are surprised. Uh, what do companies need to do, whether they're small or large, to address these challenges? Um, I mean, how do they take a different path, and how is Google taking a different path? Well, I mean, I do think when I talk to these most companies, I do think like their leaders are pretty short-term focused. And um, yeah, I was giving people the question like, imagine you're running Exxon, what do you do? Say so you want to do something good. Um, this is one of the, I guess, the most valuable company on earth. Um, a lot of people think probably it's not doing good things, like worried about the environment and so on. But the company has a lot of that company has a lot of capabilities. You know, has worldwide operations and manufacturing, government relations. Probably could do a lot of different things. If you took a twenty-year view, if you took a four-year view, it's a pretty hard question to answer. What do you do in the next four years? Which I think is about the average tenure of a you know, Fortune 500 CEO. Um, so if you're being measured quarterly, I mean, obviously it's good to have some pressure, you know, so you actually do things and uh, make money and improve things. But I think the four-year kind of horizon for the leaders is pretty difficult. It's pretty difficult to solve big problems in four years. Um, I think it's probably pretty easy to do it in 20 years. So from, I think our whole system is kind of set up in a way that uh, makes it difficult for leaders of really big companies. I mean, eventually what you're doing kind of doesn't make sense over time for whatever reasons, environmental or social or whatever it is. Um, and I think companies have a big problem making a big transition um, so they get replaced. So I'd love both of you to comment a little bit on where Google is. What are the couple of things that become really, really critical for Google to do in the next five to 15 years? What, what areas are gonna be critical? Um, I, I think there, if there were a couple areas that were critical, then you know, we'd, that would be too vulnerable a spot to be in a way. I mean, there are many, many opportunities to, to broadly use technology to, to impact the world and to have a successful business. And we try to invest in in at least in the places where we see a good fit to our company. But that could be many, many bets, and only a few of them need to pay off. Uh, I guess from my perspective, running Google X, that's you know kind of my job is to, uh, to invest in a number of opportunities, each one of which may be a big bet. Uh, but I hope, well, I guess you have a portfolio too. <laughs> but I hope across that portfolio, some of them pay off. And... Um, some of them are connected to our existing business and some not so much. If you look at the uh, self-driving cars, for example, uh, I hope that that could really transform uh, transportation around the world uh, and reduce the need for individual car ownership, the need for parking, uh, road congestion, and so forth. Um, so you know, if that was successful in its own right, I'd be super happy. Um, it's obviously still a big bet. It's got many technical and policy risks. Uh, but if you are willing to make a number of bets like that, you got to hope that some of them will pay off. Mm -hmm. Larry, any particular areas you think um, are critical to Google's success the next few years? Um, areas you, you don't want to screw up in? <laughs> I mean, I think like uh, we're pretty excited about Android, uh, Android obviously. Um, I think that, um, you know, have our traditional purchases, obviously search and things like that. I think, um, one of the things like people have been confused about, you know, people are like, well, what is Google? Like, why, why are you guys coherent? 
And, um, you know, it's really interesting when you look at search, just really trying to understand everything in the world, make sense of it, organize it for people. You know, we kind of we said, well, you know, we're doing that. And a lot of the queries are actually about places. So we need to understand places. And then we said, well, a lot of the queries are, you know, about content we can't find. We do books. Um, and so on. So we've kind of been gradually expanding that. And um, if you look at things like Google Now also, you know, actually, well, maybe you don't want to ask a question. Maybe you want to just have it answered for you before you ask it. Uh, that would be better. Um, you know, originally the I'm feeling lucky button, I was supposed to be, you should be able to skip the search results and go directly to the answer. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work that well. Um, you know, it was kind of an obtuse naming um, of the feature. But that was, you know, that was the same kind of idea. And uh, I guess we feel like right now that computers are still pretty bad. I mean, you're just messing around, you know, you're kind of scrolling on your touch screen phone and trying to find, you know, you're in a car and it's bouncy and you can't, doesn't really work. Um, and so I think the actual amount of kind of knowledge you get out of your computer versus the amount of time you spend is still pretty bad. And so I think our job is to kind of solve that. And most of the things we're doing make sense in that, in that context. So along those lines, one of the areas I know you've both been very interested in um, is machine learning um, and, and AI as it's been called in the past. And in the past, it's never quite reached its uh, potential or s speculated potential. How far do you think it is as a technology and how much of a role do you think it plays going forward? Well, look, this is our latest model right here. <laughs> See, not perfect yet, but <laughs> doing pretty well. Um, uh, so in the machine learning realm, uh, we have several uh, kinds of efforts going on. Uh, there's, for example, the Brain Project, which is really machine learning uh, focused, and it takes inputs such as vision, and in fact, we've been using it for the self-driving cars uh, it's been helpful there. It's been helpful for uh, a number of Google services. Uh, and then there's sort of more general intelligence, um, uh, like the uh, DeepMind uh, acquisition that, you know, in theory, we, we hope will one day be fully reasoning AI. Uh, now those are obviously computer sciences. Scientists have been promising that for decades and not at all delivered. So I think it would be foolish for us to make prognoses about that. But you know, we do have uh, lots of proof points that one can create intelligent things in the world because all of us are around. Um, and, uh, and therefore, you should presume that someday we will be able to make machines that can reason and think and do things uh, better than we can. So uh, in this group is a bunch of people who are addressing the beginnings of the machine learning revolution. There's people replacing farm workers so you can weed plants and provide plant by plant care. People who are, make, are doing machi machines to build, make hamburgers automatically, all the way up the chain to people replacing law clerks or legal clerks, uh, or even doctors, the psychiatrists, the ENT specialists, uh, you name it. So the whole span from very simple work to very large work is being replaced where, uh, in a way that is a little bit scary. Um, and I want to come back before we finish to the social aspects of some of the technology changes. But I do wonder if the vast majority of jobs in that we know today, like more than 50%, might be replaced by machines that can do that human judgment piece better. Uh, well, we've been working on the venture investment machine learning. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of um, true, actually. <laughs> as long as I can buy uh, one, I'm good. <laughs> um, that is kind of what Google Ventures does, no? Um, they, they, they started that way. I don't know if they're actually doing that. Like, I don't know. They keep hiring partners for whatever reason. So, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know maybe it might not be working so well on the algorithm front. Or... In fact, one of the early Excite employees, Graham Spencer, was yeah. working on this project yes. at Google now. 
Yes. Yeah, ceramic. Okay. Maybe they just sit around and have parties. Maybe they are using the algorithm. I don't even. I don't know what goes on in the ventures building. Um, but I, I do think that, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the things that people do have been over the past century replaced by machines and will I continue think to be. Ninety percent of people used to be farmers, no? Yeah, no. I, so I, it's I, happened I, before, you know. Yeah. It's, not surprising. Yeah, the vast majority of employment in, uh, shifted from farming to only needing about 2% of the U.S. workforce. That happened between 1900 and the year 2000. And I see the beginnings of that happening again with the rapid acceleration the next 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, I, I totally believe we should be living in a time of abundance, you know, like a Peter Diamandis' book. I think, like... Um, yeah, if you really think about the things that you need to like make yourself happy, you know, it's like housing, security, opportunity for your kids. I mean, anthropologists have identified these things. Um, I mean, it's not that hard for us to provide those things. Like, I mean, the amount of resources we need to do that, the amount of work that actually needs to go into that, it's pretty small. You know, I'm guessing less than 1%. Yeah. Um, at the moment. So the idea that everyone needs to work frantically to meet people's needs is just not true. So I think, I do think there's a problem that we kind of don't recognize that. And I think there's also like kind of a social problem that a lot of people aren't happy if they don't have anything to do. So we need to give people things to do, you know. You need to feel like you're needed and wanted and, and have something productive to do. But I think the mix with that and, um, the industries we actually need and so on are pretty, there's not a good correspondence. That's why we're busy destroying the environment and doing other things. Maybe we don't need to be doing. So I'm pretty worried until we figure that out, we're not going to have a good outcome. One thing I was talking to Richard Branson about this, they have a huge problem there, you know, they don't have enough jobs in the UK. So they've, he's been trying to get people to hire two part-time people instead of one full-time. So at least the young people can have a half-time job rather than no job. Um, and it's slightly greater cost for employers. I was thinking the extension of that is you just, if you have kind of global unemployment or widespread unemployment, you just reduce work time. You know, everyone I've asked, I've asked a lot of people about this to say, um, maybe not you guys, but most people, if I ask them, like, would you like, you know, an extra week of vacation? You know, they raise their hands, 100% of people. Two weeks or four day work week. Everyone will raise their hand. Most people like working, but they'd also like to have more time with their family or to do their own interest. So that would be one way to deal with the problem is if you had a coordinated way to just reduce work week. And then if you had slightly less employment, you could adjust and people would still have jobs. Um, I, I'll quibble a little bit that I don't think in the near term the need for uh, labor is going away. I mean, it gets shifted from one place to another, but. People always want more stuff or more entertainment or more creativity or more something. Uh, I mean, I think it's kind of an imperfect system, so there's no reason that it really will correspond. There's been some economics arguments that that's not as true now as it has been. But, I mean, that could be to other kinds of governance problems and so on. But nobody really knows the answer to that question. Yeah, but the, let's... Since we went into the social domain. Um, there's short-term issues like we are seeing in San Francisco. Uh, you know, people not appreciating that people who are part of the ideas economy in some way are doing much better than people who aren't. I mean, San Francisco thing is really a governance problem because we're not building, we're building lots of jobs, lots of office buildings and no housing. And so, um, it's not surprising that causes a lot of issues, and you also have a lot of people who are renting, rent controlled, and so they don't participate in the economic increase in housing prices. It actually hurts them, it doesn't help them. Mm -hmm. So um, I think those problems are more structural and very serious problems. Um, we're not really on path to fix those problems as a Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but there may be indicators that income distribution will get more lopsided over time. Yeah, that's true. That's also a big issue. Right. Uh, and I fundamentally believe we moved from an economy of labor and capital to an economy of ideas. 
And most economists haven't caught on to this change, that ideas are a disproportionately large part of the growth of the economy, um, which uh, I won't go too deep in there, but it leads to some interesting questions and the Republican-Democratic divide about taxes and income redistribution may become much more critical and much more intense. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. That seems to be... Uh, we don't have to go there if you... No, I mean, I, I think... Uh, I mean, I, I think the ideally one would you know, try to tax more of the things that we don't want and, and uh, you know, either subsidize or encourage the things that we do want. So, um, I mean, I think, you know, the kinds of things people spend money on that are wasteful, you could imagine having higher taxes on, or, you know, things that are harmful, like carbon, uh, it could yeah. be taxed at a higher rate, and that would, uh, you know, on the one hand, presumably slow wasteful spending, uh, but on the other hand, perhaps we could encourage the kinds of investments that we want to be making. Yeah, you know, looking 40 years out, I, I find it hard to imagine why we won't need to support half the population to not work, but pursue other interests that are interesting to them. Um, you know, suddenly X Games is an entertainment event instead of a sport. Um, any, anyway, let me go back to Google. Um, we talked a little bit about self-driving cars. Uh, how large a change do you think that can cause to happen in society? Uh, you know, either one of you speculate on how large a change that might mean. It's more than just the software. Yeah, uh, I mean, I hope it can be a, a really dramatic change. I mean, you know, off the bat, of course, there's the many people who currently cannot get around if they're too old, too young, uh, disabled, and so forth. Uh, but that's, you know, still just a fraction of the population. I think the bigger changes can come to the community, the lifestyle, the land use. I mean, so much of our land uh, in most cities, about uh, 30 to 50 percent is parking, which is a tremendous waste. Uh, and, uh, and also the roads themselves, which are both congested and take a lot of space and are just unpleasant. Uh, so with self-driving cars, you don't really need uh, much in the way of parking because you only need... You don't need you know one car per person. They just come and get you when you need them. Uh, and uh, you can also make much more efficient road use if you. And this is not something we've uh, developed yet, but it's certainly been simulated by many. Uh, you know, they can form trains. They can go at high speed, perhaps uh, much higher than our highway speeds here. Um, fundamentally, they can just make much more efficient use of the space uh, and people, therefore, people's time. So I think that can be really transformative. Yeah. Um, real quickly, and, and I love the car because it's such a radical chance, transformation in economics. The way I look at it, a car is $300 a month to lease, a driver is $300 a day. A driverless car is 97% cost reduction in the cost of a driven car, making it cheaper than a car you own, probably. So it completely changes economics. But the Traditional auto companies aren't going to want a large reduction in the number of cars. Um, well, it depends if they have a five-year view or a 20-year view. <laughs> well, it also depends if they're the ones producing them. I mean, yes, uh, any individual company might be happy as long as they're the ones making those cars. So do you think Google gets into the business of making cars, potentially? Not that I'm asking you to announce what you're doing, but speculate 10 years from now. Um, well, I'm very excited about the technology that we're building, but it's still in its uh, early stages. Um, I think eventually in the future, um, there might be you know, multiple partners uh, or uh, you know, companies that we work with. That, you know, some of them can be manufacturers and some uh, might be service providers. Uh, this is all pretty speculative right now. I'm working hard to just get the basics of the technology working. Um, but the ideal, uh, the ideal self-driven car is not one that's, uh, um, you know, we've experimented where we convert the Lexuses and the Priuses. Uh, but it's also really nice to, you know, not have a steering wheel, not have pedals, you know, maybe the seats should face each other, things like that. So it's not, um, I'm not sure that the traditional car designs are ideal for self-driving. 
Um, let me go back to Larry. As CEO of Google, a lot of these guys have board members who keep saying, focus on a few things. Self-driving cars is one. You've done some things in health and others. How do you decide when, when, what's focused and what's unfocused? Yeah, my thinking about this has changed quite a bit over the years. I think um, the ISO is kind of stupid if you have this big company and you can only do like five things. Um, and I think it's also not very good for the employees because then you have like 30,000 employees and they're all doing the same thing, um, which isn't very exciting for them. So I think um, ideally a company would scale the number of things it does with the number of people, kind of in a linear fashion. And as far as I can tell, that never happens. It's like, you know, logarithmic with the number of people, um, if that. Um, and I would always have this debate actually with Steve Jobs. He'd be like, you guys are doing too much stuff. And I'd be like, yeah, that's true. Um, uh, and he was right, I mean, in some sense. But I think the, the answer to that, which I only kind of came to recently as we were talking about this stuff, is that if you're doing things that are highly interrelated, then there is some complexity limit. You know, it's all going to escalate to the CEO or something. Because you have things that are unrelated, they're going to, at some point, they have to get integrated. Um, so a lot of our internet stuff is like that. I mean, user experience needs to make sense. It needs to make feel like you're using Google, not that you're using something else. And so I think um, there is a limit to kind of how much we can do there, and we have to think carefully about it. The great thing about the automated cars is like Sergey can do that, and I don't have to talk to him. <laughs> um, I mean, I like talking to him, but I don't really have to talk to him about that because it has almost zero impact on the rest of our business. Although it does use some great engineers we have, you know, on mapping and other things, naturally move to that project. But that's a, you know, that's a that's a scalable process. I don't have to talk to those engineers; they just move magically. Um, so I do think companies usually try to do very adjacent things. They figure, oh, we're going to know exactly how to do something, you know, that's very similar to what we already do. And the problem with that is that causes a management burden. Whereas if you did something a little less related, you can actually, I think, handle more things. Yeah. So and, and I should know, yeah, for Google X, I created a set of rules for our projects that, by design, uh, keep us farther away from main Google. Uh, for example, we focus on uh, atoms, not bits. I mean, what we do involves a lot of software, but it always has a key non-software component, like, you know, obviously the cars have cars, even though they have a lot of software. And, Balloons. Um, the balloons, yes. Uh, the internet uh, uh, project balloon. We have internet uh, via balloon, uh, high altitude balloons. Uh, we have uh, the uh, kite based power, the flying wind turbines. And all these things are pretty physical. And uh, that's by design. In fact, when I um, focused on Google X, I shifted out a few projects which seemed closer to Google's core. Yeah. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say for startups, maybe, I mean, you need to get one thing done well, or else you don't have permission to do anything else. Yeah. Um, but for big companies, I think it's a little different. Mm -hmm. um, that leads to another strategy question, uh, and I want to get off this, and I'm going to go a little bit long since we have both Larry and Sergey, so uh, we'll take those extra 10 minutes. Um, can you imagine, given your interest, you've had some interest in health, uh, there's some radical stuff there, you, Android is a natural platform for health, mobile is, and health needs to be distributed in highly accessible broadly, not just at the hospital. Can you imagine Google becoming a health company, which may be a larger business than the search business or the media business? Or I, I think it's for sure a larger business. I just, uh, and in fact, Google X, for example, we do have the uh, glucose uh, us, uh, reading contact lenses. Um, so we do. Which are very cool. Um, yeah, I, I don't wear them. Uh, well, I don't wear contacts, and I don't know the need to measure my glucose. But uh, they should be coming along pretty well. I'm very excited about that. Uh, generally, um, the. You know, health is just so heavily regulated, it's just a painful business to be in. It's just not necessarily, you know, how, uh, you know, I want to spend my time. Even though we do have some health projects and we'll be doing that to a certain extent. 
but I think the regulatory burden in the U.S. is uh, is so high that it's I think it would dissuade a lot of entrepreneurs. We have we have Calico, obviously we did with our Levinson, um, which is a pretty independent effort, um, focused on health and longevity. I'm really excited about that. Um, I think that. Um, I am really excited about the possibility of data also to improve health, but that's, I think, what Sergey is saying. It's so heavily regulated. It's a difficult area. Yeah, you know, I've been giving an example. Imagine you had 10,000, or imagine you had the ability to search people's medical records in the U.S. You know, any researcher, medical researcher, could do it. You know, maybe they have the names removed. <laughs> and maybe when the medical researcher searches your data, you get to see which researcher searched it and why. I mean, I imagine that would save 10,000 lives like in the first year. Just that. And that's almost impossible to do because of HIPAA. Yeah. So I do worry, you know, we kind of regulate ourselves out of some really great possibilities that are certainly on the data mining. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, two or three years ago, I wrote a blog uh, called Do We Need Doctors? And I speculated Dr. Algorithm will do most of the work. Uh, Unmold from Ginger I.O. is in here somewhere. They introduced their psychiatric monitoring app at Kaiser. Yeah, I was talking to them about that last night. Yeah. That's cool. In the first week, the Kaiser believes they saved three suicides because the apps alerted the nurse that the patient was in a very in a suicidal state. Um, that's just the beginning to come. But that feels like a software business, mostly delivered mostly through mobile, um, I, I, and it's more needed in the least regulated areas, India, Africa, places like that. So, um, I, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say in the U.S., I think, you know, diabetes and heart disease are both about three or four hundred billion dollars a year in expense. Um, yeah. That's of the one point two trillion, so it's a pretty big chunk. So definitely just making a dent in those yeah. would be a big deal for people. And in fact, the first, uh, most people may not know this, but the first mobile app got approved as a pharmaceutical because it's directly competitive with uh, metformin, which is the principal drug for blood sugar reduction. So it has the same effect, and the FDA approved it, of course, with the funny caveat that it has to be refilled every three months. And it's... <laughs> Uh, and it's priced at $182 a month. <laughs> uh, so, um, Do you want to take any from the audience? Or you? Yeah, let's, uh, I want to have one question for you, Larry. Um, you lost your voice last year. You've talked a little bit about what you learned from that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was great. Sergey encouraged me to you know, make all the details public, and um, that was really great to get a lot of feedback and information and things like that. Um, so, I mean, that's a good example, I think, you know, we're talking about medicine, but a lot of the angst people have about their medical records is related to insurance, which we can just fix the insurance. Point of insurance is to cover uh, medical issues. So we somehow worked ourselves into a state around that. Obviously, I don't care very much about that, so I don't have that issue. But I think, um, anyway, I don't think my wife's likely to get much worse, so I'm happy about that. Get my job done fine. Why don't we open it up to a few questions from the audience? Question over there. I got a microphone in the back. Oh, is there a mic going around? Yeah. Hello. Hey, uh, I'm Vivek. Uh, Co-founders are super important for uh, building a company, and you guys are doing great for 15 years. Um, have you sort of like fundamentally disagreed on something at all over, over the last 15 years, and how did you, how did you resolve? Oh, where do I start? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> what are you talking about? We disagree all the time. Not like fundamentally. No, no, we really disagree. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're fundamentally um, disagreeing on uh, whether they disagree. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I think, you know, I think if you get to know somebody over a long period of time we're working together for so long and we you know are committed to doing that you don't like get agitated about one little thing or the other I don't know we work it through and also generally we've gotten 
to think uh, remarkably alike, which scares some people around us, I guess. Yeah, and the other thing, I mean, we know enough, I guess, that when we're disagreeing, I mean, you make a lot of calls that aren't obvious, so, I mean, if you're disagreeing, it's probably that it's not obvious what to do. Uh, let's see, there's whoever has yeah. the mic, ask the question. Eric? Yeah. So, uh, back to the original question of the kind of alternative universe where you sold to Excite. Um, you know, you were grad students, you could imagine that that happened, right? If they, maybe it was 10 million, maybe it was 100 million, right? There's some price that might have made that happen. What do you think you would have done next after working at Excite for a couple of years? Well, I think we'd be very happy. We'd have like a nice house. And... I don't know. Do you remember the Founders Dungeon? No. Yeah, when we toured Excite, this was one of the kind of our things about it. They toured us around. It was actually, I think it was like Tarabella or something. It's one of the buildings we now occupy. Yeah. But um, <laughs> they, uh, anyway, here's these offices, these offices. We go downstairs and they like locked away this one founder. I don't remember which one it was. He's like in a little closet downstairs. He goes, yeah, I'm so happy down here. And he's just in this little janitor's closet. It was like a little dungeon. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's hard to say. I don't. I mean, I don't know how long I would have stayed. To be honest, I don't even. Know, I don't know if it would have been a good acquisition for them. To be honest, I don't know that we would have been so passionate or uh, productive or whatnot. Yeah, I think that's true. Hi, uh, you mentioned the um, limitations of a four-year outlook versus a twenty-year outlook. I'm wondering um, your thoughts on governments and their limitations in uh, you know, having these limited terms um, and what, it, what would be government 2.0 in your mind? Boy, I don't know. That's a really big topic, I think, um, which I don't know very much about. But I, I do worry that when I look at the governments, you know, our interaction with governments or things we get interested in, spectrum or whatever, that it becomes pretty illogical. Um, and I think the reasons aren't that the people aren't good and they're trying to do good things. I mean, most people you talk to in government you know, are in there for the right reasons. They're not there for the pay, typically. Um, they're there because they want to make the world better. But I think the set of rules that we have, um, one thing that I would observe is that the complexity of government increases over time. So if you just look at all of our democracies around the world, you know, the amount of regulation and law we have increases without bound. So I was trying to reduce the complexity in Google. I was saying, we're getting to be a bigger company. Let's take our rules and regulations. Let's make them, make sure they stay at 50 pages so that people can actually read it. But the problem that I discovered about that was that by reference, we include the entire law and regulation of the entire world. Because we're a multinational company, we operate everywhere. Our employees, what they do affects everything. And so in some sense, We'd have to read, you know, the 100 million pages of law and regulation that are out there. It's probably something like that. I, mean, I don't know how much it is, but it's very big and getting bigger. So one thing I proposed is that, you know, I was talking to some government leaders. I said, actually, the president of South Korea was great. I said, hey, why don't you just limit your law and regulation to some set of pages? And when you add a page, you have to take one away. <laughs> and she actually wrote this down. She's great. Um, <laughs> And, Is that uh, one of the pages now? Yes. <laughs> no, that's only one sentence, you know. Um, but I do think that otherwise I think our, the government's likely to kind of collapse under its own weight, despite people being good and well-meaning, just because of that one issue of complexity increasing. Um, I just don't think it's reasonable. And when we went public, you know, laws were from 60 years ago. If you took a random law professor, locked them in a room, and told them to rewrite those rules, you'd have something much better come out. Um, but we're not doing that. Larry, we... Uh, and How do you know that? You don't know about the dungeons filled with law professors? <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> that's the other Google X project I have. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, we we got to finish up, but there's one question I want you to just address because a lot of founders deal with this. Uh, you started off as CEO, got Eric as CEO for a while, took back over. Can you sort of just speak to how the experience was? Was it retrospectively, was it the good way to do it, a bad way to do it? 
how would you have done it different or would you do it the same? It's something everybody here struggles with or a lot of people struggle with. I mean, I think it turned out pretty well. Uh, so I think that's really good. I think, um, and Eric's a great, great uh, leader and I think we learned a tremendous amount from him. And I think we ran pretty effectively also as a team for a long time uh, on those things. So I think, I mean, I think these are very personal decisions and and um, I think there's probably no right answer. I think if you have a really long time period, obviously, um, I think, you know, you can probably learn the things you need to know about management or not. I mean, like I said, it's a personal decision. Um, I think running a company, startup is really a big commitment. Um, it takes a lot out of you, out of your life uh, to do well, I think. Um, I'm sure the same is true for companies as they get bigger. Um, so I'm not sure that's for everyone. Um, some people are good at starting things, um, not good at finishing things. Um, and I think uh, organizations have trouble recognizing that too. I think, um, and those are difficult transitions for people. Um, in general, I think, you know, if you have a project or a company and it can have stable leadership, you know, over 20 years, that's better than not. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's been a treat to have both of you here. And, uh, really appreciate the time to have you to drive here, or in Sergey's case, to kiteboard here. <laughs> he didn't quite make it. I only made it halfway, which is the worst <laughs> distance to actually make it. But I turned around and went back. There wasn't wind on this side of the yeah. bridge. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, but, uh, but I think ultimately for me, it was just about wanting to actually, you know, search seemed pretty important. It was about actually wanting to do something in that area. And it didn't seem like that was going to happen in these organizations. Yeah. You know, it's amazing when the business people take over how rational they get focused on short-term revenue and lose the long-term vision. Um, that's a good place to kick off on a different point. Um, there's a, most companies end up in failure, and I'm not talking about just the startups, but if you look at the S&P 500, so many of the very large companies keep going out of business at an increasing rate. Um, people are surprised. Uh, what do companies need to do, whether they're small or large, to address these challenges? Um, I mean, how do they take a different path, and how is Google taking a different path? Well, I mean, I do think when I talk to these most companies, I do think like their leaders are pretty short-term focused. And um, yeah, I was giving people the question, like, imagine you're running Exxon. He had faked the reply. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, back then, you know, the ethics around faking you weren't quite the same. Anyway, um, so he had that big joke, and the deal obviously never came to fruition, and we went uh, our own way uh, to build, build search. So the way I remember it, we actually agreed on a deal around $350,000. What? This is typical. <laughs> are, you, are you trying to renegotiate this now? But, <laughs> Uh, but I had a hard time getting the management team to agree that they should uh, acquire Google. I think he's saying that they were having our time going to 350 and we were having a hard time changing our number. Yeah, that, they felt they didn't need it. Uh, but, you know, I, I start here for one very simple reason. There are many, many instances where things could have gone either way. And I'm really glad they didn't acquire because the world might have been a very, very different place. Looking back in retrospect, I feel like it would have been really, really sad if, in fact, uh, Larry and Sergey had sold the company and not pursued the vision and changed the way, the world the way they have. So, uh, I've... It's, it's actually kind of an interesting story because... 
The reason we didn't sell it is not so much the money. I mean, like, I don't know, we were like grad students, you know, eating burritos or whatever. So like a million dollars was a fair amount. Um, the reason I think we really didn't sell the company was that we talked to all the search companies at the time, and they just weren't interested in what we were doing. And so, and it was obviously like, didn't want to buy like, you know, this company that didn't really have anything without the people. So they wanted us, but like, we were like, well, why are we going to work at this place that doesn't believe in search? You know, it's not going to cause anything good to happen. So I think ultimately we didn't sell for that reason, just that they weren't interested in it, which is the same reason they, whatever, had trouble getting to a million dollars, which I guess at the time was a lot of money. Um, Remember them, you know, InfoSeq, Excite, Lycos, uh, and uh, probably the greatest interest came from Excite, and actually came from Vinod. You were the, the investor in Excite, uh, and we spent a while uh, talking to them, ta and, and talking talking to you, Vinod. Yeah. Um, you remember that. Uh, in the end, um, I don't think the management team there was quite as excited about it, no pun intended. Um, but I remember we were, you know, we were just, there were four grad of us at the time, four grad students at Stanford, and I remember we fired off a note to the note. It was just like a little email. We said, like, you know, we don't really want to sell, but okay, for $1.6 million, you got a deal. And uh, a few minutes later, we got a reply and said, that's a lot of dough, but okay, we'll do it. Um, I know, that's characteristic of a note, right? So then, <laughs> 10 minutes later, Scott, one of the four of us, comes running in, laughing, huge grin on his face. I, I hate it when people say somebody needs no introduction, then goes on to introduce them. Uh, uh, but, go uh, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, but I do want to start in the realm of what might have been. Um, a few years ago, uh, I think 1997, uh, Larry and Sergey almost got acquired. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this? And I always wonder what the world, how the world might be different if that had, in fact, happened. Uh, well, uh, we had developed this technology we called uh, PageRank, sadly not BrinRank, but anyway, it probably would have sold better that way. But um, uh, we had developed this technology that we found was useful for search. It by itself uh, it wasn't really a complete search engine. What we had kind of just searched titles of web pages and, uh, and ranked them quite well. Uh, but we showed it to a bunch of the existing search companies back then. Some of you might 